And welcome to this web page. You've stumbled on here by accident or maybe on purpose. Who knows? This is a first message on the web page. It's kind of a test run, so we'll see how it works out. The purpose of this message is to give a quick thing on salvation, and then after salvation, what? It says in John 3.36, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey, that is the command not to believe in him, the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his uniquely born Son, that whoever believes upon him shall never perish, but have eternal life. That verse says it all. We've quoted that verse so many times. People have heard it on TV, Sunday school, friends. But it says to believe. There's a lot of people adding to John 3.16 today. They think that in order to be saved, you must believe and be baptized. Well, the thief on the cross told Jesus, remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus said, surely you will be me today in paradise. That man on the cross just believed. And there's a lot of people that say, well, in, in such rare uh, occasions like that where you can't be baptized or where there's no altar, you know, God will uh, take up the slack. And that's heretical thinking, and it's wrong. The Word of God through the Bible says, believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus Christ. And you will be saved. There's a lot of people, they always have these altar calls for whatever reason, to see who comes down. And if you went down to an altar, well, that's your business. An altar doesn't save you. There's no holiness in an altar. All it is is a bunch of plywood made by man with paint and nails. This is the church age. We live in the dispensation of the church. But salvation in any dispensation has always been faith alone and Christ alone. As it says in the book of Hebrews, that Abraham believed and it was a credit to him for righteousness. So the issue is, if you're not saved, how does one become saved? But Jesus Christ, nearly 2,000 years ago, went to the cross for your sins. And what does that mean? Well, back in the days of Adam and Eve, the first two human beings to walk around, they were born, or they were created, rather, in a state of perfection, with only one mandate, a prohibition. And God said, the day you eat of that fruit, you will die. And that's actually in the plural in the Hebrew, which you could better translate, dying, you shall die. When they ate of the fruit, they did not die right away physically. They lived another 900 years according to the scriptures. So when God said, dying, you will die, physical death, of course, came later. They would have lived forever had they never ate of that fruit. They were in a state of perfection. But dying, you will die, in the plural. But they died spiritually immediately. And what did they do? They tried to put on fig leaves. They seen their nakedness. They were afraid of God. They had no relationship with God. But God made a redemptive salvation solution. People always say, you know, if he's God, why can't he just say, well, okay, you can, you can come to heaven. Just uh, why do you have to go to the cross? Because God is not a liar. And God must stay true to his word. He told Adam... The day you eat of that fruit, you will die. You can't say later, well, I was just kidding, or, okay, now you can become alive again. The, when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, they were spiritually dead. They had no relationship with God. There was an insurmountable wall, so to speak, between God and man. And the only solution 
to this problem was that Jesus Christ, who was God in the flesh, took our place on the cross. He bore our sins. He became the substitute for us. He was born as Adam was created in a state of perfection and without sin. He bore our judgment, our penalty of sin, that all we have to do is accept that substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross to accept that gift by faith, faith in Jesus Christ, that he is the Savior, he is the Messiah, and he is the only way that we can go to the Father or to have a relationship restored to the Father. Jesus Christ was our mediator. To be a mediator, you have to be equal with both parties. Jesus Christ has undiminished humanity and deity. He was undiminished deity in his hypostatic union, which meant he was God and man. He represented both parties. If you want salvation, if you're not sure about your salvation, there's a lot of junk on TV, there's a lot of crap that we all see and hear, but if you're not sure of your salvation, if you made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, if you went down to an altar, if you felt you had to, to weep tears of repentance at the altar, if you believed you had to tell God you're sorry for all your sins, that's not the way of salvation. It doesn't say feel sorry for sins and receive Christ. If you invited Jesus Christ into your heart, that's not salvation. It doesn't say invite Jesus Christ into your heart. And more than that, uh, Jeremiah 17 I believe it's 17.7, says the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? If you invite Jesus in your heart, you're inviting him to a place that's desperately wicked. We don't invite Jesus anywhere. We come to him. He died on the cross. We go to him. We accept the redemptive solution. And again, how do we do it? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. What's only begotten? Uniquely born son. He was uniquely born. He was born spiritually alive as Adam was created spiritually alive. He bore our sins on the cross. John 3.16 For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him shall not die, shall never die, but have eternal life, everlasting life. The issue for salvation is faith alone and Christ alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourself. There's nothing you do. God did all, he done all the work, and he does all the work every time in salvation. We do nothing. If you walk down an aisle, if you cry tears of repentance, that's you doing something. And if you've got a Bible, look at that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For faith. By grace we've been saved. By God's grace we've been saved. Through faith. Faith in him. And not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. Lest any man can boast. We can't boast about it. We've done nothing. So if you made that decision, and just believe in Christ. Tell God the Father right now that you are accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And if you want to be more dramatic, tell him that you believe that he died on the cross for your sins, that he's the Savior, that he's the Messiah. So then, after salvation, what? That's always the big question. People think, now I'm saved, now I can just go join a church anywhere and sing and have a good time and just feel Jesus. We're commanded to study the Word of God by a pastor who's teaching the Bible. There's a lot of pastors today. They teach a lot of concepts and topics. And uh, if you're a serious student, if you really want to know God, it comes down to this. What, now that you're a Christian, what do you want to do with your life? Do you want to serve God or do you want to serve yourself? Hebrews 4.12 it says the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Also says in 1 Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Ephesians 4:11 says that God gave spiritual gifts to people, and He gave the gift of pastor teacher to teach us the word of God. And if you're one of the arrogant types that think you can just open the Bible and learn all of the great doctrines and mysteries for yourself 
then you're going to get nowhere in this spiritual life. God gave the gift of pastor teacher to teach the people. The spiritual gift is a gift so the pastor can dig in the word and hopefully he'll have it, uh, he won't have any distractions like an occupation. That would be his full-time occupation because it's a full-time occupation to study the Bible. We need, and, and most people, we're working all the time, we're busy. We don't have time to study the Bible like we want to. And furthermore, we don't have the spiritual gift of pastor-teacher. That's why the pastor does his job to study the Word of God. He teaches us Bible doctrine. So as a believer, we're commanded to study the Word of God. Jesus said in Matthew, If you love me, you'll follow my commandments. The only way you're going to follow his commandments is to learn his commandments. A lot of people, they say they love Jesus and they'll sing songs and they won't care about learning the Bible. And a lot of people go to church and don't even learn the Bible in church. Let me tell you, if all you do is go to church every Sunday, you're going to get nowhere in a hurry. We need to learn the Word of God. And I strongly suggest in this day of the Internet, in this day of CD-ROMs and cassettes and all other types of, I think mean, there's always books, find a pastor teacher who's teaching the Word of God verse by verse. There are some that I personally in, enjoy studying under. Colonel, Colonel R.B. Thame, Jr. of uh, Bracket Church, Houston, Texas. B. Daughtry of Albany Bible Church, Albany, Georgia. Just do a web search for those people. Or even Robert McLaughlin Bible Ministries, which is at www.gbible.org. It's a good starter to learn the Word of God. Colonel Theme has developed 10 problem-solving devices for the church-age believer. And you need to learn these problem-solving devices. You need to master them. Because every day when you face problems in your life, the solution is found in the Word of God. Not by getting a Bible and just feeling it and trying to feel God or putting on a gospel record and listening to gospel music, but we need to be renewed by the thinking of our mind. Philippians says to put on the mind of Christ, put on the thinking of Christ. Let Christ dwell in you, the thinking. When Jesus in Matthew 4, in Luke 4, was in the desert for 40 days, he then was tempted by Satan. Of course, Satan wanted to have him sin, so he could not go to the cross or have him follow or have him uh, submit to Satan in order to try to get him to not go to the cross. But how did Jesus Christ deal with that tremendous testing situation? He handled it by having Bible doctrine, the word of God in his soul. He fought off Satan by verses, Bible doctrine. When you have problems in life, you need to claim a verse. What's a good verse? 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Just knowing that, that God cares for you. And that's just one verse out of many. 900,000. Who knows how many's in there? I never counted. I want to give you the 10 problems, seven devices real quick. And if you're a new believer, new to the word of God, I highly recommend that you get the basic tapes by Colonel Thame. Or some basic books by Colonel Thame, but get some Bible teaching. But these problem-solving devices are vital. Number one is rebound. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wrongdoing. That's very important. The purpose of this message is not to teach problem-solving devices, but number one, rebound is extremely important. When we sin, we need to confess that sin, and to confess it Homo logeto in the Greek means you name it, to cite it, to claim it. It doesn't mean to go to some priest and confess your sin to him. We go to God. We have access to God. We, 1 John 1 and 9. You, you sin, no matter what it is, you name it. And I know a lot of people, I've seen this before, you be talking to someone and they'll cuss or something like that. And they think they've sinned and they'll say, Father, forgive me. Now that's not using 1 John 1, 9. 1 John 1, 9 says if we confess our sins, if we name our sins, He is faithful and just to cleanse us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness, our wrongdoing. 
It doesn't say to ask for forgiveness. And, and people get emotional about this, but do what the Bible says. 1 John 1, 9. Read that verse, bookmark it, write it down, put it on your computer for a screensaver. When you sin, you name that sin. You just tell God, the Father, that you sinned. Name that sin. Well, don't tell me you just sinned, but name that sin. Father, I fornicated last night. I got skunk drunk. Whatever it is. I smoked marijuana. I lied. It's very important. And if you don't know all the categories of sin, and there's a lot of categories of sin, that's why we need to, again, to get under a pastor. Jealousy is a sin. Being bitter is a sin. Being mad is a sin. Confess that sin, and then forget about it. Paul says in Philippians, uh, uh, forgetting those things which are behind, but I press on. When you've committed a sin and you name it to God, you forget about it and you press on. That's rebound. First John 1 John 1.9. The second, and that's the first problem solving device. The second one is the filling of the Holy Spirit. The third one is the faith rest drill. And the faith rest drill means to claim a promise. When you are in a situation, in a jam, you need to stabilize your soul. And how do we do that? By claiming the Word of God. And you must know the Word of God to begin with. Number four of the ten problem solving devices is grace orientation. Understanding grace and all of its concepts. It's a very deep doctrine. We think grace is so easy to understand and comprehend. You could write books and books and books on grace. Number five is doctrinal orientation. And that's understanding doctrines. You can understand, you can learn a lot of verses, but when you start to understand doctrines, like the doctrine of eternal security, uh, the doctrine of unlimited atonement, uh, meaning that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all mankind, not just for a select few, when you start to learn doctrines, you start to think doctrinal rationales, and you start to apply doctrine to the situations of life. For instance, if you're in a jam, you can think of the doctrine of the foreknowledge of God, that God in eternity past, before you were created, he knew your whole life as you would live it out. Just as in the book of Revelation, when the tribulation is going to come, and it's all detailed what Satan's going to do, what these demon armies are going to do, what the people are going to do. God knows our life before we've even lived it. And he's made provisions to take care of us. You read so often through the Bible the, the timing of God, how a person like Elijah, when the uh, brook sheriff uh, dried up on him, God says, okay, go now to Zarephath, and you'll meet a widow there. So he met the widow of Zarephath, and just as he met her, she was about to give up on life. If you, that's in uh, 1 Kings chapter uh, 17, that Elijah said, let me have some water, please, and some cake. And she says, I got just enough for one meal. My son and I are going to eat it, and then we're going to die. But God sent Elijah to meet her at the right time. She just about gave up. But God sent some provision her way. And when we face problems in life, God knew of our problems before they happened. We think when we face a problem that we need to pray now to God for help. And prayer is always a vital communication thing for God. But you must realize that God knew our problem beforehand. That's the foreknowledge of God. And he knew to take care of us. In fact, it says in Corinthians, no testing has overtaken you, which is common to man. Everyone's faced these same problems that we face. But God makes a way of escape. Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. You could rephrase that. And we know that God works all things together for good to those who love him who are called according to his purpose. So that's the foreknowledge of God. When you face a problem, just realize and understand that God knew this problem in eternity past. And he knew a solution. He made a solution. And if we were just trusting God, that solution is on its way. Number six is a personal sense of destiny. Realizing that our destiny is not just down here and uh, chasing after these things we want, getting a house or getting married. Our true destiny is in heaven. Number seven, personal love for God the Father. The only way we're going to personally love God the Father is to know God the Father. You don't love someone you don't know. And the only way we're going to love God and love Jesus Christ is to know them. The only way you're going to get to know them is studying the Word of God. Not by singing songs, not by just thinking about them, but by knowing Him, knowing God through 
the Bible. I don't know why people don't want to understand the Bible. I don't know why they don't want to read the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. We need to learn it. We need to learn under a pastor who's, who dedicates his life to study the Word of God through the Greek and the Hebrew. And those pastors that I mentioned earlier do just that, and I highly recommend that you get under them. Number eight is impersonal love for all mankind. God says, uh, Jesus Christ said that you should love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't mean to go out and just uh, be nice to everybody and go out of your way, but to respect them. You love someone, you respect them. Respect them. Respect them out of their privacy. Don't judge them. Don't always try to step on their toes. Number nine is plus eight, sharing the happiness of God. And a verse for that is Hebrews 12, 2. Number ten, occupation with Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 20 and 21. That was just a real, real, real quick super fast uh, presentation of the 10 problem solving devices and probably very super silly as too. But like I said, this is just a quick introductory lesson for the web page. Kind of a test run. Maybe more will come later. But I'd like to leave you now with some verses. If you're facing situations in life and you want some verses to jot down or remember, then I'm going to end this message now with some verses for you. Psalm 56.3 says, When I am afraid, I will put my trust in thee. Proverbs 2.8 Guarding the path of justice, and he preserves the way of his godly ones. And this one is one of my favorite. Isaiah 41.10 Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41.10 Another one of my personal favorites is Philippians 4.6 Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That says a mouthful. Philippians 4.6 Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, God will answer every prayer that we pray if we use the 1 John 1, 9 principle of first confessing your sins. Now, God may answer our prayer as no. It must be according to his will. But we, we walk by faith and not sight. So if we don't get the things that we want, there's a reason for it. God's our Heavenly Father, and he deals with us in love. As it says in John 3.16, that God so loved the world. You know, he loved us when we were yet um, not even saved, we're unbelievers. How much more will he do for us now that we're his children? Deuteronomy 23 and 4 says, Do not be faint-hearted, do not be afraid, or panic, or tremble before them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight with you against your enemies to save you. Ephesians 3.20 Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. It was Ephesians 3.20 Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Philippians 4.19 And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And finally, I want to close out with 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of tim timidity or fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, rational thinking. That also could be translated discipline, as it is in the New American Standard Bible. Well, this concludes this introductory uh, tape on the webpage here. I hope it's been somewhat of an edification for you. Again, we're here to learn about our Lord and Savior. First, to accept Him as our Savior, Jesus Christ. To learn about Him. To magnify Him. To glorify Him. This life is short. Jo uh, James 4.14 4, What is your life but a mere vapor that appears only for a moment and then vanishes away? 